So I really hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as I am. And I just wanted to take a little break to tell you about the amazing products by the sponsor of this podcast, the Biophotonic EMF and Bioresonance devices, which help us take our healing to the next frequency. So let me start with the Bioresonance devices. Biophotonic have two amazing little devices, the little Bionexus and the biophotonic and both of these are really the next generation in bioresonance devices so let's start with the little bionexus this amazing little device um, literally sits in the palm of your hand and it's now my go-to support especially when doing my daily manifestations and affirmation practices but it will balance out my frequency to work on whatever needs balancing for me right here right now so what are some of the benefits of this little bionexus? Improved energy, decreased inflammation, supports our immune system, psychological homeostasis. Um, but also it supports the integrity of the cells, improves our memory, cognitive, emotional and psychological states and speeds up recovery. And just like we've been talking about today, it really improves human consciousness support. Now, the other bioresonance device, the biophotonic, absolutely amazing little device, um, comes preloaded with a range of therapies. And this will clear parasites, giving active protection. You can wear it with you. It comes in a little pouch that you can wear around your neck and it detoxifies heavy metals, clears EMF radiation out of cells, cleanses bacteria and viruses, detoxes chemicals and toxins, DNA repair, pain repair, you name it. And it's even got calming meditation practices that, well, complexes that you can run to strengthen the aura field and frequency packs can also be added to your water. I think we all know the detrimental effects now of mobile Bluetooth and EMF radiation. They've been extensively studied and I've done loads of videos on it. So minimizing our exposure is crucial. So what's really key is both the Biophotonic and the Bionexus. They're standalone lovely little devices that don't require Bluetooth connection, a Wi-Fi connection. You don't need to buy any frequency packages. There's no subscription fee and you don't need a mobile phone to control them. Um, there's no electrodes. They're completely wireless, ready to use straight from the box. So you can get these and a full range of EMF protection devices that you can use for yourself and your pets. Don't forget to use coupon code CE20 to get 20% off all products, including the EMF protection. Thank you. And now back to the podcast. Right, so this video is really important for any animal lovers out there. Anyone that's thinking about spaying or neutering their dog, before you make any decisions, there's some must-know facts that could impact your dog's health, behaviour and overall well-being. From traditional procedures to hormone sparing options, there's so much more to sterilisation than we might think. So in this video, the lovely Dr Peter Tobias and I, we're going to really break down everything we need to be thinking about, asking your veterinarian about to make the best choice for your animal and yourself. So please don't make a decision until you've fully heard this story. But if your dog's already sterilised, then please watch this video to see things that you might want to look out for and what options are there to support your dog. So it's this is really a must watch for every dog parent. Um, so let me just introduce my guest to you, a returning guest, a very popular returning guest to my channel, Dr. Peter Tobias. We've done a couple of podcasts together before, but Peter's had over 30 years of experience as a veterinarian. He has a background in both holistic and conventional veterinary medicine, animal homeopathy and natural nutrition. In 2008, he sold his thriving holistic veterinary practice in North Vancouver, Canada, to pursue his passion for educating the public about disease prevention and natural treatment pr protocols. His goal is to help dog lovers create a healthy and long life for their kind and friends. He also has an amazing supplement range for humans now and dogs, and all his products are made from all natural human grade ingredients and are certified organic wherever possible. So a big welcome, Peter. How are you doing today? And this is such an important subject for us all, isn't it? 
Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for having me as always. Um, I, I've looked forward to chatting because this topic that we are going to take on today is super important. And I must say that my life has completely been shattered and shaken by the discoveries of some of the researchers um, in the field of hormone hormone health and hormonal health of, of, of um, dogs and cats. Yeah. Um, the interesting part was that this time, instead of dogs teaching us, this time the human medical system and research has been actually the impetus to actually start the research in dogs and cats because um uh, yeah that's how it happens sometimes that humans have certain symptoms and then we look wow you know could it be possible that 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 certain problems that we've been dealing with dogs for decades actually are related to the fact that we spay and neuter them so there's been a huge huge change and shift on the research level which is relatively new um it all started you know the the most common the the, the kind of the the deeper research was published in 2020 uh there are some studies that were suggesting that there were some problems just kind of taking a group of dogs and looking at their medical history and seeing the medical conditions that they've suffered from uh the the most known study is uh, on golden retrievers and the incidence of cancer and lymphoma whether they're neutered or not and um and that has been very significant and in favor of not neutering our dogs. But then for about a decade, there was quiet until Dr. Michelle Katzler, who is now my dear colleague and friend, and I've talked to her several times, came up with uh, a confirmation what we thought was, was happening. And that was in 2020. Uh, if you're interested in the details of the study, uh, she actually had a group of family Rottweilers, and she noticed that the neuter dogs actually were not doing very well, and they were dying of cancer very early. So she looked around and she was thinking, what if it is actually related to spaying and neutering? And she's actually a therionologist, uh, a veterinarian who uh, specializes in, in reproduction. She's a board certified specialist. So, uh, you know, she, she is definitely an expert in the field. And she started to look at basically an incident of different problems and issues in neuter dogs. And she studied especially a condition such as cruciate ligament tear and hypothyroidism and discover that after dogs get neutered and spayed, but especially neutered um, because the, the male hormones are omnipresent and there is not much of a cyclic kind of nature, uh, that after these dogs get neutered, they actually have very severe elevation of luteinizing hormone. And the luteinizing hormone is basically a hormone that stimulates the gonads to produce sex hormones in normal situation. But once you remove the gonads, the luteinizing hormone doesn't have anywhere to go. Plus the pituitary gland that produces the hormone goes into alert because there is not enough estrogen and not enough testosterone. So uh, it starts producing more and more luteinizing hormone. And the levels go from zero to three to, to 90 to 150. So there is like a 30 to 50 time elevation of this hormone and what happens with this hormone because it doesn't have the gonads to kind of latch onto the receptors and uh, it goes to it latches onto tissues where the receptors are and interestingly enough the receptors in the tissue also multiply so suddenly you have uh, luteinizing hormone causing inflammation and havoc in the thyroid gland or in the ligaments and joints and muscles and and as the research progressed she actually um concluded that not only these these endocrine issues like hypothyroidism and ligament tears, but also cancer and organ disease and allergies and and you know inflammatory issues in in dogs are related to to um spaying and neutering so this was a huge huge discovery and she also discovered that uh, the receptors are present in the emotional centers of the brain so if people actually notice that their dogs actually start being afraid and fearful after being neutered and behaving and acting differently there is actually a scientific basis now for that how i got to this and you know i i, I know that you probably have many questions but i would like to actually say how i got to this research i have a five-year-old dog and at the age of two he was neutered actually at 18 months, so not two years, but 18 months, I thought I was a good dog owner. And so I neutered my dog. And within six months, he started being lame. And uh, he 
experienced shifting lameness and basically within a few years we were not able to do any swimming any hiking any activities that we love to do and you know i i pretty much am pretty much skilled in nutrition and supplementation and i have physical therapists and chiropractors all that involved in treating my dog and he was not getting better so i basically looked and looked and looked until i stumbled upon the research of Dr. Katzler mm -hmm. and uh, also Parsemus uh, Foundation, which is the organization that funds the uh, the research, and uh, basically decided to put my dog on hormone replacement therapy, which is something that we'll talk about as well. And pretty much within three months, I've had a dog that is fine, not limping. After two and a half or three years of actually trying to figure out what's going on and so on, he basically stopped limping and uh, he's like a new dog emotionally and physically and overall. So I feel like this has been a amazing learning experience, but now I'm at the point where I really want to share the information with anyone who needs to. And at the same time, I actually keep running into dogs who need this support and who have been affected by, by the, the absence of hormones. So, yeah. There's so much in there. And I just want to say to anyone watching this, you know, Dr. Peter, I've been following Dr. Peter Tobias for more years than I care to remember. And this is such a good point that you said is every single one of us never stops learning. And mm -hmm. every animal teaches mm -hmm. something new and no one ever knows it all. Because as a lot of people, I, I work a lot one-to-one -one with people on their animals and there's so much guilt involved as a human because we take the best decisions that we can with the information that's presented with us. And then of course, we get more research coming out, more evidence, a different mm. animal shows us some different feedback. And the thing is we learn from that. So when we're going through this today, Please, whoever's watching, this isn't about what's right or wrong. It's about how we as a community can really spread this information and help more animals and more humans in the process and help to really let our vets know that this information is out there. Um, because interestingly, I've got two rescue dogs and I have been so slated for not spaying them. And interestingly, the way I got to that decision is in my in my work that I do with humans and animals, there's so much talk now about endocrine disruptors that are everywhere in our environments, or in our water, our air, our furniture, our bedding, everything. And I think there's such an awareness now of hormonal health and how it impacts every aspect of our health. You know, most people realise now that you can't that's why so many people are passionate about the holistic approach. You can't take one thing in isolation and think it's not going to have a knock on effect to everything else. So I love the fact that more people are noticing this and asking questions. And it's really quite chilling when you hear some of the information that we're going to cover today. But the important thing is what we all do with it. You know, it's going to raise some issues and some, you know, emotions for people when they hear it and they think back to some of their loved ones and their animals but all we can do is move forward with the information and make choices based on new information you know i fully agree first um it is not about who is right and who is wrong it is about what is actually the best for our pets and and you know several times in my in my career i had to basically just shift and turn around and throw away what i learned because I realized I was doing something that wasn't necessarily beneficial. And it happens to all of us. The good news is that all the objectives that we have with our pets, whether it's keeping them healthy, whether it's keeping them from being homeless and abundant and overpopulated, and also for those who have been neutered and spayed, there is also a solution. So this is actually the, the, the most important part, that all the objectives that we have in a de developed society, if we can call our society that way, we can still maintain while we are actually not harming the animals. And, you know, I, I, when I kind of look back, I was thinking, how is it possible that I have missed on such an important piece of information? And that is hormonal health. 
And why do we think, or why did we think that removing the gonads is actually not going to affect every cell in the body? And I've seen that firsthand with my dog. And, you know, I did mention with uh, Dr. Michelle Katzler that she had these dogs and she derived her studies from human studies. Well, what goes on in humans, uh, menopause is actually a very similar kind of situation where the luteinizing hormone elevates. And in human studies, they uh, discovered that, you know, the, the sore joints and the sore muscles and the shoulders that happen to women after 45 or 50. And, you know, uh, many doctors would blame them for just being too sensitive and, and in quotes, whiny, but, but it is not true. It is actually a real serious problem. So these studies have been there. Hormone replacement therapy already has been, you know, um, really on the way in human medicine. And now we have a very important task to actually create this shift together, um, whether it's the the dog guardians and, and cat guardians demanding um, different procedures that will be hormone sparing, or veterinarians going and taking courses and the people who are actually specializing and doing the research actually lecturing as well. But it's going to take some time. And I, you know, I feel I feel really relieved. And also it's really alarming to see that very possibly a large portion of all medical conditions, and I'm talking ligamentaris and chronic organ disease and allergies and uh, ear problems and hypothyroidism, cancer, are related actually to the absence of, of uh, gonads and sex hormones. So it's, 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 from my perspective, it's one of the most uh, medical system shattering actually finding in the last uh, several decades. And I'm very grateful to the researchers who've done that. And uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah. So let's go back to some basics for people listening here. So when we're talking about traditional sterilization for male dogs and female dogs, how has it traditionally been done? And I know certainly here in the UK, and I deal with a lot of plants, particularly in America, even still, a lot of the time is the advice is to get it done before a year of age. So talk us through what most people have been doing so far and some of the pros and cons of that. So um, there are several different approaches. I think that that the mainstream kind of veterinary community is still spaying, trying to delay spay and neuter because we understand that the growth plates and the bone development and over, overall body development has to happen and happens more effectively with hormones on board. So, uh, you know, spaying and neutering, most veterinarians would say, before, some veterinarians say before the first heat, some veterinarians say after the first heat. Um, and now I've been noticing a trend doing it a little later. Mm -hmm. However, there are rescue organization and, and, and shelters and societies that basically feel that we uh, <laughs> dog guardians actually are not responsible enough and that they have to spay and neuter their dogs or the dogs that they're adopting at the age of um, 12 weeks or sometimes even earlier, which has been proven to be actually very, very damaging. And I've been actually having some challenges and problems with the local uh, shelters in um, the British Columbia, Canada, because I've been very adamantly against this, um, this practice and um, and uh, it has not been an easy thing uh, for me to actually go against it. But, you know, ultimately, um, now the research is in and we know that these practices have to change. Now, the question is, how quickly are they going to change? Because I can see a lot of resistance. And once again, there is a there's a new guideline that has been established this year where the World Small Animal Veterinary Association actually divides the, the pets into responsibly owned and those who are in shelters or who are not owned by people who are responsible. And that's a question, how do we determine who that is? But basically the World Small Animal Veterinary Association says, if you are a responsible dog guardian, you should not be neutering and spaying your animal. So that's actually the, it's actually, it's a guideline that came out in May, 2024. So it's very, very new. And I'm, relieved and thrilled um yeah. my plan is actually yeah it's it's amazing uh professor 
Italian professor Stefano Romagnoli actually uh, was the leader of the of the group that established these guidelines and just published them this year. So um, amazing. Can you send and, me those afterwards so I can put the link below for people? Of course, of course, I will do that. Um, so, so again, um, the the general. I'm going to just repeat because there is a lot of information. So the general kind of veterinary community space and neuter somewhere between six months and 18 months. And, and that's very common practice. Shelters have been doing that much earlier. And now there's a trend to actually obviously change that. There are some countries and I'm very, I admire those countries and, and, and those nations, Norway, Denmark and Germany, they actually consider um, neuter and spay in Norway, it's actually illegal. And I think in Denmark and Germany, if I'm not wrong, and I, I know that there are some restrictions when it's going to be done or what it can be done. So, so you know, especially in Europe, and this is the interesting part as well. Some people may object that um, <laughs> animals that are not spayed and neutered uh, are more aggressive and there, is, there are more issues. And um, I just had one of my team members visiting me in Prague, where I am at right now. And, you know, we see dogs are mostly not neutered. Uh, you see regularly 16, 17 year old dogs just kind of walking in the park and they're still mobile and healthy. And the other thing is that they actually do not seem to be aggressive. They have very, they socially adjusted. They often, you know, 80% of the dogs in, in the center of Prague walk off leash on the sidewalk, very well behaved. And, and when I am in Vancouver, interestingly enough, I see a lot of fear aggression and aggression that is obviously, um, you know, there. And I suspect that this may have something to do with the, with the inflammation of the amygdala and the pituitary gland and, uh, and the hip, uh, hippocampus, sorry, that's what I wanted to say, which are emotional centers of the brain and the receptors to the luteinizing hormones were found there. And Dr. Katzler believes that that may be uh, one of the reasons why spayed and neuter dogs actually have all these phobias and, and unusual behavior. And, and interestingly enough, some people <laughs> think that when they neuter their dog that is already behaviorally uh, problematic, that they are going to solve the issue and it almost never solves, actually. So, now, we used to be told that all the time with our veterinary, and of course, this is all generalization. There will be everywhere, it will have a slightly different approach. But I was very delighted with my neighbor, actually, Peter. Um, they've got a Labrador, he, he's about um, just about coming up to a year, and they went to the vets and asked the vets to neuter them. And um, I sent them some stuff beforehand and the vet really looked into it and sort of said, actually, let's leave it and see how he does. Because the advice used to be, you know, it will sort out their aggressiveness. And we now know that actually the studies are showing that the opposite is really true. Mm -hmm. And there may be some exceptions, you know, I always say there are exceptions to anything. <laughs> Sometimes I give a good example of a grandma that is 97 and smokes, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, so there's always the bell curve of everything. But I definitely agree that 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 it's been astonishing to see the difference in behavior in the European dogs that are predominantly not neutered and spayed and the dogs in North America. And unfortunately, because of the early spayers and neuters, I think that we are we are seeing almost like a, a explosion of the different cases of cancer and, and spleen cancer and lymphoma and uh, and dogs are actually dying younger, which is really stressful for everyone and obviously for guardians, but also for veterinarians. So I think that we are looking looking ahead with uh, with optimism that this may actually really improve the health of our dogs in general. And, and that's what I'm really excited about. Absolutely. And of course, this applies to other animals as well, but we're concentrating on dogs today. So what is hormone sparing sterilization? What exactly does that mean for people? And how widely available is it? Yeah, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to um, just kind of do a little review of the hormonal axis again. We talked about it briefly at the beginning, but I think it's important to understand that. So there are two parts of the brain that are engaged in hormone production, and then there is obviously the gonads and testicles and the ovaries. So 
the hypothalamus is actually the, call it the connection between the hormonal center and the nervous system. So if a dog sees, uh, if a male dog sees a nice female, then the hypothalamus will, will release gonadotropin releasing hormone. And that will signal the pituitary gland to produce luteinizing hormone. And luteinizing hormone will, will send signals to the gonads. And in males, it'll produce uh, the testosterone and females estrogen, but also there are some other hormones like uh, progesterone and so on. So it's a little compli more complicated in females, but basically see it as a, as a, you know, the general, the hypothalamus that signals the, the, the captain, the pituitary gland, and that goes to the gonads. Um, hormone sparing sterilization consists of not removing the gonads, but preventing pregnancies. So in, in, in human males, it's uh, very common to do vasectomies at certain point. In females, what we can do, we can actually leave the ovaries, but remove the uterus. And by removing the uterus, you will not have the bleeding and the heat, but you will have the the hormone presence. Now, some some veterinarians still believe that estrogen actually uh, are precursors or they 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 cause um, predisposition to cancer, to mammary cancer. That has been partially debunked, and there's still a lot of studies that need to be done and, and plans to, to have more studies. In females, in human females, uh, we now know that hormone replacement therapy is safe, while 10, 20 years ago, it was believed that it actually could cause cancer, and that's why we didn't do that, right? But now, and I have some family members who have been actually on hormone replacement therapy, and they've, they've done so amazingly well, uh, human family members. And, uh, and I have a, obviously, I have a, I have a canine family member, Pax, who's doing amazingly well. But going back to vasectomies in a very sparing space, that's basically the hormone sparing sterilization. When you leave the, the testicles and you leave the ovaries alone, which leads to uh, horm normal hormone production with anticonception. So, so that's basically the goal, especially for the irresponsible um, dog ownership situations or shelters and so on. But as soon as there is someone who's responsible, and you know, it's not that difficult to actually prevent dogs from from uh, procreating. If you you know, if you have a dog, in the heat is not that long, and most people would not let a male dog run around, right? So, so you know, for responsible dog owners, the recommendation is to leave the body as it has been created, and you know, it makes a lot of sense if you think of. Um, <laughs> of anything in nature we like to muck around with it and thinking sometimes that we know better than nature but but it would be hard to find one single situation in nature that would be worse than a human invention right so it's uh and yeah. sometimes, sorry to interrupt there but sometimes the madness in the world around us we saw this with the pandemic and whatever everyone's thoughts on that. But sometimes these are trigger points for people to have a shift in consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the moment in the human population, there's a huge amount of, you know, what is a male, what is a female, um, huge amounts of debates about young allowing youngsters you know to, to young people to actually change sex and go through all that that involved with that and sometimes this outcry can really start getting people to start thinking very differently about well hang on a minute mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. like the idea of that I would hate that to happen to my child let me think about what I'm doing to my animal um so I think sometimes something good can come out of something that is very traumatic for the population as a whole really yeah you're you're right because you know we have um in our close circle of friends we have actually two situations where their children actually decided to transgender and um what i am noticing is that they have absolutely zero understanding of what actually happens when the gonads are removed and uh, that it is not just you know the body is not a car where you remove and you modify like this is a serious impact that will actually last a lifetime and i think that you know, I'm. I understand that there may be some gender dysphoria that is true and real. I know that. Um, you know, I always give an example in the '90s when Princess Di was around and she was bulimic. Many people were bulimic, and uh, now bulimia is not 
it doesn't seem to be as common, but but this this kind of tendency. And I, you know, I I don't want to really um, get too much into it, but I do think that people should really have a good understanding, a deep understanding of what happens when hormones are absent, or or when they're blocked, or when they are given in a different way. And I I think that that people should wait and wait it out and 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 support these individuals um, as much as they can. And, you know, I didn't expect to get into this particular topic, but I listen to a lot of podcasts and I'm definitely interested in in the evolution of humankind and what, what's going on. I love this point, uh, especially dogs, because I'm, you know, I'm focusing on dogs. I've been focusing on dogs for some time. Well, again, show us that it is it should not be taken lightly and maybe it'll they'll help us to prevent some tragedies in the human 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 lives and. Yeah, I, you know, I, I am concerned about this as well as you are, definitely. I just think, you know, that, that, that there's no accident why all these things come up to the surface together and we can all learn and help each other and really start, you know, but most, most pet owners haven't been taught to ask questions about this or it's not been in their awareness because it's mm -hmm. always been, this is what you do when you get a dog or a cat. Cats are a, a different problem altogether because obviously it's much harder to control a cat. Um, you know, try, yeah. try telling mine where they can and can't go. It's a losing battle. You know, vasectomies could be actually could be done in male male cats, and there are certain tattoos that uh, that people can apply to the skin. So we know that there is they're basically not fertile, but it, it's more cats are actually, they, they get triggered. Their ovulation, ovulation gets triggered by the presence of males. So it's a little more difficult. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. So in terms of the hormones sparing neutering options, how widely available are they? Are they, could people, could most people watching this go to their veterinarian and ask for this as an option? Is that going to be possible? I would say that it is not available in most clinics, but the number is rising. And, and this is where dog lovers can can really create and help to create the change. Because if, if people demand certain services, veterinarians will very quickly realize that they need to learn them. Uh, in the guidelines of World Small Animal Veterinary Association, there's a there's a very detailed description how to do these procedures. Uh, I know that Dr. Katzler has been going around the world and teaching veterinarians how to do that. Um, I've been uh, really looking into doing fundraisers and trying to kind of fund these um, educational sessions and seminars and and training. Um, I think it's going to happen, but no, it's not available in most clinics. However, there is an organization that is called Parsemus.org, Parsemus Foundation, P-A-R-S-E-M-U-S.org. And they have a list of available clinics where they do hormone sparing sterilization and hormone replacement as well for those dogs and cats that have been spayed and have certain symptoms, but especially dogs. Wonderful. So that's one thing that people can really help with by going and asking, starting the conversation if if it's necessary at all. Um, but obviously we have got the rescue centres to deal with and everything as well. So it's a great thing to have that choice for people. You've now become quite an expert through your experience with Pats on the hormone replacement. So talk mm -hmm. us through what options are available there and when should someone be going to ask their veterinarian about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, in the process of uh, establishing or restoring health, uh, I've created something that or just came up with something that I call the healing cycle, where you have to basically, um, you know, address nutrition and detox and spinal alignment and, and body strength and rehabilitation. Then we also uh, recommend some mitochondria boosting with NMN and other substances. And then the last little piece of the puzzle has been actually hormone replacement in those animals that uh, that have been affected by it. And, you know, when Pax was limping, I had absolutely zero idea that this could be connected with hormones. Um, ironically, when he started limping, I had my colleagues and friends, Dr. Becker and Rodney Habib, visiting in Prague. And I remember exactly as if it was today, three years ago, 
where he hopped out of the car and he wasn't weight bearing. And then over the few days he was shifting, had shifting lameness and, you know, front and behind end. And I thought it would be Lyme disease actually, because there are a lot of ticks. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was very lucky to, well, lucky. It took me forever to actually discover uh, the studies. And then I connected with um, one of the researchers from Parsemis, um, Dr. Linda Brent, who had a dog who was on hormone replacement therapy and her dog experienced exactly the same symptoms of shifting lameness and low energy. And, uh, you know, Pax was a young dog. Like he was basically, you know, when he started, he was two and a half or three years, three years of age. So I, I connected with Linda and there's an interview online if people want to um, watch it or listen to it. I connected with her and it took me forever to make the decision to actually start hormone replacement therapy because obviously it's not anything that is done regularly. And I have been kind of indoctrinated into believing that it could possibly cause harm. But Linda was very helpful um she's a biologist by profession uh she studied primates and and so on and and, and ended up with uh, being research on dogs as well so she you know we kind of i i called her texted her, i said I, i'm really not sure whether i should do that and then you know a few more situations where pax was really not feeling well i kind of thought okay i need to do that so the hormone replacement therapy consists of two steps and um Actually, it can be done two different ways, but Dr. Brent and I believe that the, that the most effective way is to, number one, neutralize the luteinizing hormone. And this is the paradox because there is a medication that is available in Europe, available in Canada, and unfortunately not that readily available in the US. But this medication called um, suprelorin, uh, the active ingredient is defluralin is normally used for blocking the luteinizing hormone to prevent sex hormone production and sterilize males, wow. normally, unneutered males. So this is the medication that is used in ferrets and dogs to prevent them temporarily from forming sperm. However, if dogs are neutered and, he, and the dog has a lot of luteinizing hormone, then you can use this medication to basically decrease the production, to stop the production. I was a little curious to see what would happen just with the suprelerin on its own. And so I gave this implant, which actually there's either six month implant or 12 month implant. I implanted it under the skin. That's that's one of the, the challenges that the needle is quite large. It's like if you're injecting a microchip, very similar size. And so I, I implanted the implant and Pax just basically looked like he ran a marathon for about 24 hours. He just slept and slept and slept. And I almost worried that there was something wrong with him. And then within a few days, I noticed that there was much less inflammation in his back and he was just happier. But without the testosterone, which I now consider important part of the treatment, he actually started to lose his hair coat. And it's one of the side effects of the medication. So, you know, I was in, in actually, I was in the US and uh, testosterone is not really readily available. And I, so I had had him on the suprelor and couldn't give him testosterone. And I had a dog that was actually losing hair in clumps. And I was like, oh my goodness, what did I do? And so then I arrived to Canada and we started giving him weekly dose of subcutaneous under the skin testosterone. 0.5 milligrams per kilogram weekly. And within a month, I could see like, you know, the, basically the itching and the, the skin issues stop immediately. And then within a month, I could see a very clear, noticeable difference in his attitude and his energy. But he continued to limp maybe for two more months. And... Um, Luckily, and I don't really know what exactly played a role, but we also introduced laser therapy. And I, in the real desire to come up with something that would help Pax, I actually, in the meantime, formulated a mobility product, which is called joint powder and joint powder. So I put him on joint powder and then I put him on, uh, then we did laser therapy and we continued the hormone therapy. And within two months, he, he was just like, amazing. And I never expected... I never thought that he could actually recover as quickly and as well. 
And that was in June of this year, 2024. And we've done all the stuff that we used to do, swimming and, and hiking. Yeah. And he's he has not limped one single time. And he's full of energy and he likes to sniff and, you know, and, and, and is just super happy. And this is what made me realize that how, how important hormones are to our dog's happiness mm -hmm. and how important hormones are to our own happiness, right? Like when you see the, you know, the, the changes as people age and progress, like I, I'm going to use the example of the grumpy old men. I thought they were just grouchy, yeah. but there may be a problem there too. And some people assume that 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 dogs just get old, middle aged. They just get a little, you know, a little mopey and just kind of sleep a lot. And you know, some people call them lazy. I don't think so. Now I just know that this is the, this is this is what's going on. And so it shook my universe, mm -hmm. and I feel like there is not a day where I would not run into a dog that actually I think is affected by this condition, whether it's skin issues, allergies, cancer, ear problems, you know, history of lameness of all sorts of different kind. One of my 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 um, employees, team members, actually has a dog that has exactly the same symptoms as Pax. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, we were not able to introduce the treatment on time for him to spare his cruciate ligament. So he had to go through surgery. But you know, now he's actually on the treatment for about a month and he's starting to get better too. So mm -hmm. Uh, there's so much that we can do. And I I feel like I, you know, like after 30 years in medicine, you go, you know, maybe it's time to kind of do something, paint or learn music or singing. And I just feel completely fired up, but also super distraught by the impact and by the fact that there are still thousands and hundreds of thousands of animals getting spayed and neutered and they're getting affected. So I have a sense of urgency that we need to do something fast, fast, fast. Absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing that because, you know, it's so difficult when we go through these things, but actually mm -hmm. when we then talk about them and share what has worked and you've been mm -hmm. minded enough to sort of um, let go of one of your belief systems and try something for the good of packs and that's going to help loads of other animals as well. So that's really wonderful to see. And I think, you know, we, we all go through stages with that, you know, with, with with challenges and then we have to look at the world in a different way. So with with a summary for people, if we could summarize this for if mm -hmm. people are listening now and they're thinking, oh, my goodness. So would the first step be if the animal if we're talking dogs here at the moment, cats are a little bit more complex. Um, but if you've got a dog, if you're in a responsible home. Do not spay or neuter. Do not spay or neuter. Do not spay or neuter. That would be, that's the right, the official recommendation of the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. So that's basically what they say. That's the preferred way to go. Yeah. And this is going to be very interesting. There's going to be so many knock-on effects because I know over here, for example, if people send their dogs to doggy daycare, then they have to be spayed or neutered. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of a rollout and this is why I want to make sure the links are below and all the links to Dr. Peter's resources, which are multiple, so that you can be armed with the right information to start having those discussions with people, um, which is so, so important because these decisions, once you've taken them, uh, you know, once you've removed a body part, then you're on to, you know, a very different trajectory of, of what you can do about things. And quite often, Peter, they're not going to notice things until things have got quite severe, are they? You know, uh, yeah, uh, I I think that it, it's really right now, we know that there is still much more research needed to be done. And, um, you know, I've been thinking of several different possible studies that could be done. Um, you know, the incidence of chronic disease like allergies or inflammatory bowel disease. And I'm not necessarily saying that all of it will be connected to hormones, but I do have a feeling that if we have an animal that is unwell and is spayed and neutered, our, our goal and, and objective should be to either measure the luteinizing hormone and see if it's elevated because not all the animals will get affected the same way. Um, and if it's elevated, then uh, it's imperative to actually start hormone 
hormone replacement therapy from my point of view. It doesn't really make sense to take my dog to um, rehabilitation and acupuncture and chiropractors and or you know treat them for allergies or anything else until I actually sort the hormones out. And th this has been actually the 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 most predominant actually or the most mind opening shift in how I approach my cases. And, and, you know, I, I, sometimes I feel like I've been out of actively practicing for some time. I have decided that, that my role now should be just to kind of help to coordinate and, and spread the information that, that, that needs to be, needs to be known. Uh, but I sometimes really miss that part. Like I really do. I'm currently licensed in the European Union. I used to be licensed in Canada for 25 years, but um, unfortunately, because of my beliefs, I had been given <laughs> the ultimatum that I can either produce my products and have my name connected with the nutritional um, formulas that I make or have my license, that there is a there is a bylaw that basically says I can do both. So that's an interesting one. But, you know, ultimately, as you said, like we have to actually really stay true to what we believe in and then modify our life. And and sometimes it means that we may <laughs> be less comfortable for a while to kind of like move along. And I think that people recognize that, you know, yeah, that, that this is needed. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled and also really, um, how would I say that? I, you know, I, ex I, 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 I'm, I'm expecting some, some, challenges on the way and people challenging this but um once you experience it it's there is no way back yeah so for people there'll be a lot of people watching this whose dogs have already been spayed or neutered mm -hmm. could you just give us a little overview and i know it's huge because it's virtually everything but what are some of the things that people should be looking out for in their dogs that could then trigger them to go and have this conversation oh my goodness. you know would it be would it be too much to say that every spayed and neutered animal that has any medical symptoms should actually have luteinizing hormone measured? And if it's higher, then go on hormone replacement therapy. And and I'm saying this, and I'm not neither consulting uh, directly right now, even though I, I could, uh, nor I have any particular financial interest in promoting this. So I'm just saying it because this is what I think is actually really, really needed. And I know that that dog lovers and general animal gar pet guardians are have been kind of traumatized on some level by the industry that pushes drugs and pet food and so on. So I, I think that, that it's reasonable and sensible to see certain level of distrust. But I, I do think that most veterinarians do care. And if they if they're directed in the right direction and to the studies, I think that it, they're going to be open minded. I just had one of my neighbors actually who has a dog with cancer that has been spayed very early um asking me to connect with with his veterinarian to to you know send the studies and the links so they can actually go ahead with with the hormone replacement therapy and even in dogs that have been affected by cancer I believe that neutralizing luteinizing hormone actually is going to reduce the reduce the inflammatory response and and I'm hoping that studies will prove that there's going to be positive benefit to um, treating dogs and cats with cancer as well. But that is still not confirmed. This is just a hypothesis. Yeah. And and when you look at just the biology of the mechanism and what the luteinizing hormone is doing in the body and where the receptors then multiply. Absolutely. Then a very good hypothesis and certainly an area i think also i think now's the time for a lot of us to really start those conversations and help our veterinarians out by where we've got information share it with them I mean, my vets were absolutely amazing they're very open and we had some discussions for my dogs where you've been helping me because they've got this ongoing skin allergy so i'm learning loads for that now mine aren't spayed but actually there wasn't anywhere that he could find in the uk that could test the luteinizing hormones but this is where as you say supply and demand when people put this information through then they that then it will come you know build it and they will come so if we ask for this then we know it's possible to test it so it's just a question of um some labs introducing that and if there's enough demand they will do uh, there's one one important caveat as well. When you think of um <laughs> when you think of unneeded dogs they 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 
unneutered or unspayed dogs, intact dogs, they they will have certain medical issues, right? There is no way that we're going to just solve all the health problems by not neutering and, and spaying our dogs. Like that, that would mean that all humans would be absolutely healthy. But, you know, it is an important part. Hormonal health is an important and neglected part of our health and uh, the healing cycle that we can apply to restore health and and maintain it. And And so that's the point that I want to make. So if, you know, if uh, once again, you ask the question, what, what should dog lovers do? So if there are any chronic chronic symptoms, or if there's any, you know, I personally, if I had a neutered and spayed dog, knowing what I know, I definitely would measure the luteinizing hormone. Even if they're healthy, I would actually, I would look into that and see if uh, even emotionally, mentally, energy-wise, they're actually at the right level. If they're not, then again, even if they don't have any other symptoms, I think it'd be really wise to... Um, to put them on hormone replacement therapy, or at least consider that. And, and that's been the same in humans. Like if you look at the, how much more open the medical system now is um, to hormone replacement, and that it has become a center point of discussion of many of many podcasts and, and you know programs and channels online, mm-hmm. it's uh, just inevitable that we're gonna we're gonna change the perspective i'm i'm just so hopeful and by the way i wanted to say one thing uh for those of you who are listening we will be creating a very mm-hmm. well organized concise page on hormone replacement therapy and hormone sparing sterilization and right now we have a few interviews online with dr michelle katzler and dr linda brent and uh there's an interview coming up uh kind of a conversation that i had with my colleague dr karen becker and rodney habib dr becker has been actually the first veterinarian who sounded the alarm about 10 years ago on this. And then somehow it just kind of, you know, she had other things to do and we, you know, but she was the one, she should get the credit that she was the first one uh, from the online kind of community to sound the alarm. And I'm very grateful that she did. And I, the interview is coming, coming up very shortly too. Wonderful. And I think it will open up other choices because we know in the human market, there's a lot of other natural alternatives for when you're looking at hormone replacement with herbs and homeopathy. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. This once we start having these discussions, then it doesn't mean that there won't be other more natural ways as well that will open up into the animal world just as it is in the human world. It's an interesting one because, you know, I've always said and I've had the impression that, um, hormone replacement, let's say adrenal hormone replacement for Addison's disease or thyroid hormone replacement for hypothyroidism, those treatments, I've never seen really any obvious clear side effects. Um, and and the problem is that with all the natural treatments that could be or supplements that could boost or even glandular supplement from, you know, derived from testicles and so on, or bulls or other animals, uh, they cannot be really easily quantified. So you cannot really measure. And uh, so I, you know, right now, I may change my mind over over in the course of the, uh, the next uh, few years, but unless there's research that says natural hormones and glandular supplements will provide uh, established controlled dosing of these hormones, then I would be concerned because For example, testosterone, we know that it has been abused in humans and bodybuilding and so on, and it can have negative side effects if it's given in higher than physiological doses. So the the doses that we use in humans, in dogs now, um, are weekly as opposed to the general recommendations in the past were monthly. Um, They were given two milligrams per kilogram monthly, and we are giving 0.5 milligram per kilogram weekly, which is much more subtle. Like you don't want you don't want your dog to go high and then then low again, right? Go through the roller coaster. And when it comes to females, um, many uh, the, the general opinion is that that estrogens are the hormone is the hormone of choice to supplement. Um, I even talked to my um, very longtime friend who has a human uh, reproduction clinic and obviously is an expert in hormones and lecturer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was asking her about the the the, the female cycle, do- canine female cycle, whether we should not actually make it a little more complex. And she says, you know, most likely it's going to be fine with just estrogen. But I think that that at this point, it would be really interesting 
to do some research and see whether we should somehow cycle dogs, female dogs naturally. So, and I'm kind of glad that I have a male dog at this point because I feel very confident with hormone replacement therapy in dogs. And I have not seen, and, and Parsemis also has been focusing on male dogs because it's relatively easy. But as time progresses, I'm sure they will will know more about female replacement. Right now, it means uh, low dose of estrogen together with um, with uh, suprelor and with the LH suppressing implant. Now, some people may ask, can we go without the LH suppressant? Because again, it's another medication. And based on what I've seen and what Dr. Katzler and Linda Brent, Dr. Brent told me, um, the for some reason the supplementation of the hormone itself the testosterone the, the 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 injectable testosterone doesn't suppress doesn't bring the luteinizing hormone down so based on what we know so far it's better and more effective to use the suprelorin implant and the testosterone and you know, I was actually debating when I was giving Pax a second implant because he had a six-month implant, whether I should just go without it. But he's doing so amazingly well that I just didn't want to tinker around with it. So you know, there may be some research. It would be very good to have two control groups and and have one on testosterone only and one on suprelorin and testosterone together because I think the luteinizing hormone uh, excess is actually. Uh, what causes some of the health issues that we've had, but the metabolic improvement, uh, the mood improvement, the energy level, and you know the sniffing around and acting like a normal dog—that's actually testosterone or estrogen. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I I hope everyone's found this useful, and at least even if you haven't got all the answers, you know how seriously this needs to be looked into. You've got some good information sources. All the links will be below to start really looking into this yourselves and having your discussions with your vets. And, um, you know, the more we have these discussions, the more everyone's going to learn and the better it's going to be for all our animals. Any final words from you, Peter? Oh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is just keep your mind open and don't make it about being right or wrong. Just make it about the well-being of our beloved dogs and pets in general. That's what that's what we need to focus on. Lovely. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for your time, Peter. Take thanks care. for having me. Thank so you so much for taking the time to listen. And if you feel inspired, please do share with your friends and family. This helps us spread the word and also helps me encourage some exciting new guests to take part in this podcast. And above all, stay curious and stay free.